In the course of doing research for shows, I often come across interesting facts which really wouldn't make for an entire episode. They're really interesting, but I'm not sure how I could turn it even into a short daily podcast like this one. So the solution was to create an episode where I could just randomly put all the loose ends together. With that, I bring you my very first potpourri show on this episode of Everything Everywhere Daily. This episode is sponsored by CuriosityStream. CuriosityStream has many original documentaries, including one of their latest, Return of the Wolves, which tells the story of wolves in Isle Royale National Park in Lake Superior, and the delicate balance of predator and prey with moose and wolves. Prices start as low as $2.99 per month or $19.99 per year, one of the cheapest streaming services available online. So if you love to learn, then start your subscription by visiting everything-everywhere.com slash curiositystream, or by clicking on the link in the show notes. The theme of this show, and I didn't really recognize it until I had put everything together, is survival. Surviving under very unique circumstances. The first story for this grab bag episode deals with an interesting question. Has anyone ever been hit by a meteorite? As in, has a rock which has been hurled from space entered Earth's atmosphere and then actually hit a human being on their body? The answer is surprisingly, yes. And that person actually lived. The reason why it's surprising is that the actual space taken up by human bodies is quite small. Going under the assumption that you could fit 10 humans into a square meter standing shoulder to shoulder, all 7 billion people on Earth could fit into New York City. Actually, the area is smaller than New York, and that doesn't include putting people in buildings or in subway tunnels. The odds that something would hit the Earth at the exact spot where someone is at that moment is incredibly small. Meteorites hit the Earth quite frequently, but usually it's in the middle of nowhere. In fact, calculating the odds is difficult because calculations include very large events which could affect a very large number of people, but those things rarely happen. On November 30th, 1954, at 12.46 p.m. local time in Oak Grove, Alabama, the only known case of a human getting hit by a meteorite occurred. Ann Hodges was taking a nap on her couch when a soft ball-sized rock slammed through her ceiling, hit a radio, and then bounced and hit her in the leg, giving her a large bruise. This is the only known confirmed case of someone getting hit by a meteorite that we know of. There was a case from 1677 in Italy where a priest was supposedly killed by one, but there's no real evidence behind it. Likewise, in 1992, a boy in Uganda might have been hit by a very small meteorite, which fell on him as it bounced down a tree, and that caused no damage whatsoever. And for everyone who's wondering, a meteor is something that is seen in the sky. A meteorite is one that lands on the earth. So it's impossible to be hit by a meteor. You have to be hit by a meteorite. The next subject is about the luckiest or unluckiest man and woman in the world, depending on how you want to look at it. Violet Jessup was born in 1887 in Argentina to an Irish family and moved to the UK at the age of 16. When she was 21, she took a job working as a stewardess for the White Star Line on their passenger ships which crossed the Atlantic. In 1911, she got a position on the RMS Olympic, which was the largest civilian ship in the world at that point. On the ship's fifth voyage on September 20th, 1911, the ship collided with the HMS Hawk, there were no fatalities, and the Olympic managed to limp home to port. In 1912, Violet got a job on the brand new flagship of the White Star Line, the Titanic. And I think you know where this story is going. Violet managed to survive the Titanic disaster, continuing her streak. In World War I, she worked for the Red Cross and was a stewardess on the HMHS Britannic, which was converted into a hospital ship. On November 21st, 1916, the ship either was torpedoed or hit a mine, and it sank. Again, she survived, but this time she did suffer a head injury. So I think you know what I mean. Either she was really lucky because she survived, or really unlucky because she was on three ships and almost sank, or did. In the course of researching her, I came across the story of Arthur Priest. Priest worked as a stoker on ships, which fed coal to the boilers. He served on the Titanic, which he survived. He was then on the RMS Alicantra, which was sunk in 1916 by a U-boat, where he survived. In 
He was then on the HMHS Asturias, which was sunk on March 20th, 1917, by a German U-boat. He survived. He was then on the HMHS Britannic, along with Violet Jessup, which he survived. Finally, he was on the SS Donegal, which was sunk in April 1917, which he survived. In total, he survived five different ship sinkings. Finally, there's the case of Wenman Wyka Musgrave, who also survived three different ship sinkings in one hour. On September 22nd, 1914, and you'll notice that there was a lot of ships being sunk around this time, Wenman was aboard the HMS Abacour when it was hit by a torpedo from a U-boat. He then swam to the HMS Hogue, which was nearby and on patrol with the Abacour. Just as he got on board the ship, it too was hit by a torpedo and sank. He then made it to the HMS Creasy, the third ship on the patrol, when it too was hit and sunk. Three ships, three sinkings, one hour. He managed to survive the whole ordeal by finding some driftwood and floating until he was picked up by a Dutch fishing ship. The final story of survival is that of Dr. Jerry Nielsen. She was an emergency room doctor who was stationed at the South Pole in the winter of 1998. The people who stay at the South Pole are pretty much isolated from the entire world during the winter. Planes can't fly there because there's no light and the temperatures are extreme. The average temperature during this time of year is minus 60 Celsius or minus 76 degrees Fahrenheit. And temperatures can dip below 100 degrees Fahrenheit. The team which is there has to be self-sufficient until the spring. During the winter, she discovered a lump on her breast. Consulting with the doctors, she did a biopsy on herself, but the results were inconclusive because they didn't have adequate equipment to run a proper test. The National Science Foundation arranged a rare winter airdrop for supplies so she could get the proper equipment and medicine. She also trained some of the other staff at the base to assist her so she could perform another biopsy on herself. This time, with the equipment from the airdrop, she found out that the lump was indeed cancerous. She began self-directed chemotherapy treatment at the South Pole until she was evacuated on the first flight out in the spring. Eventually, she passed away in 2007 from the cancer detected at the South Pole. She wasn't actually the first person in Antarctica to perform surgery on herself. In 1961, Leonid Rogozov was the medical officer in the Soviet Antarctic Expedition. He developed a case of appendicitis while at the base, and winter was starting to set in. Other Antarctica bases couldn't send help because of a blizzard, so he was forced to perform the appendectomy on himself. Over a period of two hours, with the help of the base meteorologist and a truck driver, he managed to perform an incision on himself, remove the appendix, and suture the wound. He became a media sensation back in the Soviet Union and was awarded a medal for his bravery. Executive producer of Everything Everywhere Daily is James Makala. Special thanks to everyone who supports the show over on Patreon. Please remember to leave a review over on Apple Podcasts. Even a simple review can really help the show get discovered in the sea of other podcasts that are out there.